Welcome, searchers and seekers. We are in the book of Leviticus, which is part of the Pentateuch or the Torah. And it starts out with verse 1. Yahweh summoned Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. So the idea of Leviticus is we're going to see a lot of Yahweh talking to Moses and explaining all of the minutia, all the little things, all the rules and regulations of the religion uh, regarding sacrifices, regarding human behavior, etc. Um, and the idea is that God told Moses this while uh, Moses and the people were still 40 years in the wilderness. Um, my take on this, and many scholars take, is that uh, this text was written actually later, um, and it makes sense that what we have here is many of the rules and regulations of the established religion uh, of Israel from probably the years 800, 700, 600, or finally codified. This probably did not happen in the desert in, in 1100 or 1200 BCE. So what we have here is more of the uh, retrofitting or retrocasting in which someone or some group of people wanted to say these are God's laws. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put it back at the time of Moses. Um, and so that retrocasting, retro, retrofitting uh, is something we see often in the biblical tradition. Uh, someone has something that's important, they want to attach an important name to it. Um, however, as, as I've looked at this and thought about this over the years, I think there's uh, potentially something really inherently dishonest. Somebody knew that these were contemporary texts and then wrote down, oh, we'll say that Yahweh told Moses this. So there is an, an inherent dishonesty in, uh, in, in retrocasting. But nevertheless, that was the culture, that was the time, that was the way things were done then. So that is how I am, am interpreting Leviticus. In chapter 1, verse 9, we read, Then the priest shall turn the hole into smoke, the hole of the offering. On the altar is a burnt offering, an offering by fire of pleasing odor to the Lord, to Yahweh. And this is anthropomorphism. This is looking at Yahweh as a sort of superhuman being. Um, so anthropos uh, means man, human being. So it's an anthropomorphic. It's looking at God in the form of a human being. So just as a human being enjoys the smell of a barbecue, so too Yahweh enjoys that smell. Uh, so it's, it's very much looking at God as a superhuman being who has very similar appetites and characteristics as a human being. So that is called anthropomorphism. And it's a very basic way in many religions of looking at the divine. Uh, what is the divine like? Well, the divine is like us human beings and has very similar characteristics. Uh, in some ways, it's a primitive way uh, of looking at the divine. Uh, so this is called anthropomorphism. The book of Leviticus has two main sources. Um, the first one is the priestly source from chapters 1 to 17, and Leviticus 17 to 26. Uh, it contains probably another source called the Holiness Code. And the uh, the first one is the priestly text, <clears throat> and the stress is on rules and regulations related to the temple and to priests, whereas the holiness code, or the H source, uh, is more general. It looks at holiness as characteristic of each individual person, uh, the whole countryside of Israel. So there's a call to holiness on a much greater scale. There are some interesting aspects in Leviticus of the priestly source, and it deals a lot with <clears throat> sacrifices to God, uh, burnt offerings, uh, but there are several things that are not mentioned. For instance, praying to God. Uh, it's, it's not uh, 
said that people should pray to God, think about God, meditate on God. Um, and yet we know the Psalms were important at some point in Israel's history, but we don't see any evidence of that here. We don't see much uh, in terms of prayers or songs or music in the, in the worship of Yahweh here. In 513, we see that some of the offerings will go to the priests. So here we have a group of religious people uh, promoting this idea of sacrifice, and uh, yet a lot of their livelihood comes from those sacrifices. So uh, I just mentioned that to be clear that there's this a problem of self-interest, and that some of the the offerings, the money, the wealth goes to the priests themselves. So this is, uh, in in part, the definition of a priest versus, say, a prophet uh, in in Israelite religion and the other religions. A priest is part of this uh, establishment religion that gets financial support from the, in this case, the temple sacrifices. There's a fascinating story in Leviticus 10. Here, this is the very first day of the sanctuary uh, being made holy, and two of Aaron's sons, so Aaron's the high priest, two of his sons are just uh, killed by Yahweh by fire. They're consumed by fire. Why would this happen? This is an unbelievable story in many ways, so let's go through it. Chapter 10 of Leviticus. Now Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, each took his censer, put fire in it, and laid incense on it. And they offered unholy fire before the Lord. So we don't quite know why it's, uh, it's unholy. Such as God, he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of Yahweh and consumed them, and they died before Yahweh. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, through those who are near me, the priests, I will show myself holy and before all the people I will be glorified. And Aaron was silent. So it's this idea that God is made holy, uh, uh, is shown to be holy by the priests. So they can't mess up because if they're doing things sloppily or the wrong way, the people are not going to see what holiness is. They're just going to see uh, a sloppy religious uh, show. But this is just fascinating. Uh, somehow, uh, the two sons did something wrong with the, the fire, he used the wrong kind of coals or something, and they are consumed by fire by God. Um, and theologically, we have to question uh, uh, the kind of God that would do this. Is this a forgiving, loving God, or is this uh, a judgmental God? And, and many people would look at passages like this as saying that the the character of Yahweh in the Old Testament is one of the, the most despicable characters in all of literature, uh, one person, one scholar wrote. Uh, so yeah, we do have the sense that yeah, Yahweh is an angry um, God who can consume human beings at times for the most petty of reasons. But perhaps it's not so petty because this deals with the essential holiness of God. Now later on, uh, the Lord... Yahweh speaks to Aaron, drink no wine or strong drink, neither you nor your sons when you enter the tent of meeting. So this is a, a further on in verse 8. Um, it's not said that, that this is what happened, uh, but perhaps this is an explanation that the sons were drunk, uh, they weren't being careful, they weren't taking their uh, positions as priests seriously, and so they got burnt to a crisp by Yahweh. So that's one possible understanding of what has happened. After Yahweh uh, spoke to Aaron about not drinking uh, wine, uh, the following is said, this is 10.10, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common, between the clean and the unclean, and you are to teach the people of Israel all the statutes that the Lord has spoken to them through Moses which is a little awkward because if, if God is speaking, why would he say the Lord? Uh, it seems like a little third person. It should be first person. <clears throat> but in any case, 
Here we have this distinction between the sacred and, and the profane, uh, between that which is holy and that which is common. And this is very, from, very familiar for many different religions. James Kugel writes, you know, let's look at what does holiness mean in the Hebrew scriptures? And I have puzzled about this uh, for many years. He says the Bible never really defines it. Perhaps the reason is that no definition was really necessary. Holy just is the sort of this unmistakable state of being. Um, holiness is said of God. Uh, holiness uh, applies to God more than anything else. And holiness is this really important uh, trait for God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, it is said. Israel's holy one. Holy is the adjective that really characterizes God and the divine, and yet, yet people can also be holy, the temple can be holy, so somehow it's things related to or of the essence of Yahweh, of God, uh, the sense of holiness. And uh, I think we can all understand it, but it's really not fully defined. Perhaps we can define it behaviorally. Uh, that which is holy, we have to act in a certain way, so we have to use the right incense, we have to make the right sacrifices, um, uh, but that really doesn't catch the, uh, the essence of, of holiness. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if you've been wondering what holiness means in the Hebrew Scriptures, so have a lot of scholars, and it's not clearly defined. In chapter 11, we have a discussion of clean and unclean foods. So this has become some part of the practice of the Jewish tradition. Uh, famously, pork is not allowed. Uh, various reasons for that have been offered. Uh, maybe it causes trichinosis or other diseases. Uh, other people have suggested that uh, the sacrifice of pork was completed in the other religions of the area. So this is a social distinction. Uh, type of regulation. Uh, it could also be that most of the people who founded Israel were pastoralists. They they um, they farmed sheep and goats. They just didn't grow pigs. So uh, let's just make that <clears throat> an unclean food. Um, so there there's more scholarship on that. On verse in verse 20, there's a, a paragraph on whether you can eat insects and there's a big discussion on that all winged in insects that walk upon all fours are detestable to you etc etc uh, so uh, I, I think it's worth reading that section 20 to 23 uh, about whether people can eat bugs uh, because here we have this is something that Yahweh is saying uh, the Lord spoke to Moses Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron so again this is that retrojection uh, this retrocasting um, of putting the things into the past into the mouth of Yahweh. Uh, this is putting our religion that we have now from about the year 800, 700, 600 back into 1100 uh, and putting all these minor, minor rules of whether uh, the people out in the desert uh, can eat locusts and grasshoppers, which in fact the people did. Um, and we're going to say that this is Yahweh actually uh, commanding this. So this is why I think um, many people find the book of Leviticus not very enlightening. It's not very theological in, in the sense of discussing the characteristics of God. It's not discussing how people should be ethical. It's dealing with these very minute rules and regulations uh, about human life. And it's really hard to believe that this is something that Yahweh would be so interested in, uh, what kind of bugs that people eat. So in, in terms of revelation, uh, in terms of the absolute authority of scripture, uh, this really makes it doubtful that every single word of the Bible is absolutely true and absolutely God's word. This is again, uh, people of the time trying to put into God's mouth their ideas uh, about religion. And generally, the biblical tradition can be interpreted this way as well. That this text, uh, Ta Biblia, the books, actually not just one book, are human attempts to understand the mystery of existence, the existence of God, 
how to behave as people, uh, how to treat others, what is the ultimate course and meaning of human life. So it's it's people attempt uh, people's attempt to put that in, into words. In chapter twelve, we have the Lord Yahweh speaking to Moses again, uh, and a, a woman is to be thought of as unclean after giving birth, uh, maybe because of the presence of blood. If she has a son, she will be unclean for seven days. But if she has a daughter, she will be unclean for two weeks. So here we see evidence of this patriarchal culture, a culture dominated by males in which women are second-class citizens and they're, uh, they're being dissed and disrespected here in this passage. So here we, we see that I don't, I don't think there's a really um, positive way of looking at this. It's almost like if you have a daughter, maybe you'd be given more time. So it's not positive. It, it's a, a status marker. Males are better than females. A son is better than a daughter. Uh, so here we see the, the patriarchal nature of this religion in this kind of passage. In chapter 17, uh, some scholars uh, believe there's the start of a holiness code, a separate kind of source that was originally added together to the priestly source to form Leviticus. <clears throat> that seems to be debated. In chapter 18, verse 21, you shall not give any of your offspring to sacrifice them to Molech, and so profane the name of your God, I am Yahweh. So this idea of child sacrifice being prohibited. And it seems that that uh, what is a historical fact uh, that this was practiced in some of the religions surrounding Canaan and in Canaan. In chapter 19, Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the community or congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. I, Yahweh, your God, am holy. You shall revere your mother and father. <clears throat> you shall keep my Sabbaths. I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Do not turn to idols or make cast images for yourselves. I am Yahweh, your God. Uh, so that's a good uh, encapsulation of the ideas of this holiness code, that everybody should be holy. Um, they, that they should focus just on Yahweh, who's their God. Do not make images of God. Do not make idols. And so some of the commandments are, are added here together. And the important ones of uh, respecting your parents and uh, keeping the Sabbaths. But the main point now here in Leviticus is this idea of holiness. You shall be holy. So not only is God holy, but you human beings should be holy, uh, which is interesting theologically because the main characteristic of God here is holiness, and that is also extended to human beings. So that is, I think, the beginnings of this great evaluation of the human soul, of human spirit, as itself holy, clean, pure. Um, and again, that is not fully defined, uh, but... Yet, whatever this idea of holiness is, it applies to God and to human beings. So, in Hebrew, uh, the word holy as an adjective is kadosh. This or that is kadosh. Yahweh is kadosh. Yahweh is holy. And as a noun, it's kedusha, holiness. Uh, and it's, it's not really defined, but it is uh, more than just the idea of, uh, like, God is uh, unapproachable in the temple, that you cannot go there. God is in the holies, holies. It's, it's not just this idea of separateness. So then if people were told to be kadosh or holy, they would just live in a cave somewhere and be uh, not approached by others. So it's <clears throat> not just the idea of separation. Uh, it is this uh, idea of uh, somehow related to God's nature. And we are called... Uh, to do that. And in chapter 19 of Leviticus, we actually have some of that 
ethical, behavioral religion that I was talking about. Some uh, some real theology here. This is more just about than just about sacrificing an animal on the right time and the right day and using the right uh, incense and fire to do it. Uh, so verse 19. Speak to the community of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am holy. I, Yahweh, your God. You shall revere your mother and father. You shall keep my Sabbaths. And then the uh, chapter goes on, and I'll just point some of them. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap to the very edges. So you're not going to take every little bit of grain. You're going to leave some for the poor people who need it. You shall not render an unjust judgment. Verse 15. You shall not judge against the poor in favor of the great, for example. And verse 17. You shall not hate in your heart anyone of your kin. You shall not reprove your neighbor, you or you will incur guilt yourself. Verse 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself, says the Lord. Verse 32, you shall rise before the aged and defer to the old, so respect older people. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien, so don't, uh, don't oppress people who are coming through your land. Verse 35, you shall not cheat in measuring length, weight, or quantity. You shall have honest balances, honest weights. Uh, so um, the idea of honesty, respect, loving other people, caring for others, this is part of what is called the holiness code. And especially in, uh, we see this in verse 19, uh, this idea of being kadosh, being holy. Uh, kedusha is the, uh, the Hebrew for this. Uh, the idea of holiness, and it is explained more. Holiness is not just about a separateness, uh, about you can't approach it, uh, it's too sacred, you can't look at it. It's, it's not that. It, it's more of an activated kind of way of behaving, but it's not just behavior. It's what's in your heart. You, you're, you're told to love your neighbor, um, and so it is something that is... Uh, emotional and spiritual. Uh, you should not, not judge people unfairly. So this idea of fairness, honesty, and uh, caring for others. Also in Leviticus, we have the description of the holidays of Day of Atonement and Sukkot or Sukkot, it's pronounced various ways. But there's a very interesting chapter theologically in chapter 24, verses 10, a man whose mother was an Israelite and whose father was an Egyptian came out among the people of Israel. And the Israelite woman's son and a certain Israelite began fighting in the camp. The Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name in a curse, the name, Hashem, the name of God. In a curse. So this is very interesting uh, in, in furthering our understanding of what uh, the importance of the name of God is uh, and what does it mean uh, to uh, speak a blasphemy or to take the Lord's name in vain. And they brought him to Moses. Now his mother name was Shalomith, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. And they put him in custody until the decision of the Lord, Yahweh, should be made to them. And Yahweh said to Moses, saying, uh, so here we have this idea of Moses talks to God about individual matters like this. Take the blasphemer outside the camp and let all who were within hearing lay their hands on his head. So everyone who heard it put their hands on their head. So in a sense, it's transferring the curse back to this guy and let the whole congregation stone him. So this man is going to be killed by having stones thrown at him for having used the name of God in a curse. And speak to the people of Israel saying, anyone who curses God 
shall bear the sin. So this idea of not just saying the name in worship or talking about God, but cursing God or using the name and, and some, uh, as a curse. <clears throat> so perhaps the idea is this. A God is holy and God is good and uh, according to the scriptures. So to curse God or say something bad about God is obviously uh, <clears throat> terrible. Uh, but also using the name of God in a curse, like may God damn you, may God uh, make things bad for you, I curse you as another person in the name of God, is sort of trying to take some of God's power and use it in a curse against another person. So it could be either of those two, but it's not just the idea of saying God's name. Uh, but here we have God referred to as the name. Uh, so God's name is very holy and sacred, even though Yahweh said that Yahweh is his name and should be his name. Uh, here it is referred to as the name, and this will be um, seen further in the Jewish tradition. Now later on in this chapter, verses 15 and on, we're seeing uh, some of the ramifications of this. One who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. The whole community shall stone the blasphemer. Aliens as well as citizens, when they blaspheme the name, shall be put to death. Anyone who kills a human being shall be put to death. You shall have one law for the alien and for the citizen. And that is verse 22. You shall have one law. It may not be apparent here but many of the legal systems of the Middle East had uh, really two sets of laws, one set for the rich and powerful, one set for everyone else. So this is seen as um, a very important ethical step that the law, the one law, applies to all people. So the rich and powerful are not going to get lesser punishments, as in uh, Hammurabi's code or other codes that there is one ethical, legal system to deal with all people, regardless of their status.